Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Llama Index webinar series. Um, today we're excited to feature RAFT or Retrieval Augmented Fine Tuning. Um, and so I'll let Tianjin talk about most of the details. I think what I liked about the paper when I first read it was this comparison to like a closed book, open book exam uh, for the LLM. And so fine tuning is kind of like a closed book exam because you have the LLM memorized knowledge before actually you know, running inference. And then open uh, the open book exam is similar to RAG where you do uh, retrieval or you're actually referencing the material when you synthesize an answer. You don't necessarily have prior context. And so RAFT is a nice way to basically combine the two. Um, and then this is a nice segue to all basically let Tangent take the lead on kind of giving an overview of the paper, uh, the results and, and uh, talk about the general idea of like RAG and fine tuning as well. So passing it over to Tangent. Yeah, thank you, Jerry, for in the introduction. Um, I'm Tianjin. I'm a final year PhD at Berkeley. I work in Skylab, so and also Bear Lab. And uh, today, this paper is about RAFT, which is uh, retriever aware fine tuning. And our whole concept is about uh, how to adapt language models to uh, RAG, which is retriever augment generation. Uh, I'll talk about this concept in later slides, but. Uh, a high level distinguish uh, or a high level concept, just like Jerry said, is how to distinguish and prepare language model for closed book exams, open book exams. And with Raft, we have a specialized setting which you can happily prepare for your open book exams. Sorry, yeah. So let me show you one example of how people are using RMs as chatbot today. Um, here, the user is asking, How are you doing? And, uh, you know, this is uh, like any language model will say, oh, I'm pretty good right now. How I can help with you today? Like a user will say, oh, let me actually, I want to travel to Hawaii. So could you send me and make me a plan? Help me figure out what's good. What's uh, the good sports activities? What's the weather in Hawaii, right? Not maybe not the weather, but uh, the what's generally are good. Um, so, and then the model would answer, actually, sure, I'm happy to help. And then it will start chatting, list out a couple options and list of a couple of suggested, uh, you know, dates based on the people usually like, maybe uh, it's very hot in the summer in Hawaii and it's usually pretty warm and rainy in the, uh, in the winter. So one of the question we want to study and uh, that is also one of the typical usage um, of Arabs uh, in, RAG is like, uh, how do we actually answer questions inside RM's training document domain versus how do we answer questions outside of RM's training document domain? Which is, uh, here's one example of in-domain, right? So, because the user is asking some very common questions like where is the capital of California? And this piece of information is sort of the, uh, the fact and appears everywhere on the internet. So hopefully your language model has seen this before in its training data. Its training can be either uh, like pre-training or instruction tuning. So the model would say, oh, it's in Sacramento. Why the model knows this piece of information? Because it has been trained on this kind of data. So there'll be probably one piece of the article or information about the capital of California and Sacramento in Wikipedia, hopefully. And the model has been trained on Wikipedia to answer these questions. So the model already baked in this kind of knowledge in the RM's training domain. But uh, what if I ask another question about, uh, you know, how do you help me find the time of the sky retreat 2024? So usually the model don't. So let's, uh, we show that's a GPT as an example. Right. The GPT would typically train until year of 2023. So if you're asking any of the enterprise private information, or in this case, it's a very time sensitive news. What happened in year 2024? Obviously the model doesn't know anything. There's no information about the timeline of our sky retreat in 2024 in the information the model has been pre-trained on. So the model would know would say something like this is due to the fact due to the effect of uh, the RHF like reinforcement learning human feedback, and the model would tend to tell you, oh sorry, I cannot help you because I don't know this piece of information. This is a uh, time sensitive information. This is sort of the news, and I only have knowledge until 2023. 
but obviously as a you know as a user or as any of the um, web developers uh, this answer is not satisfying because in these times the language model cannot help me resolve my question and one of another easy solution people developed afterwards is rag so what is rag rag is a retriever argument generation for the questions like outside of the rm's training domain the idea is actually pretty simple but very effective this would be saying oh since your question is actually out of the language model's training domain and uh, i didn't bake as a language model i didn't bake this kind of information to my weights and uh, to my pre-training data. So what do I do? I could actually do some of the retrieval or uh, web search, right? So in this case, I would say, um, can I search online from any uh, resources? Usually it's Google and see what's the timeline of, is there any piece of information like a website or like a poster? So here we have this poster. Uh, we also try to, we also would search for different, uh, like maybe the top three or top five websites, but uh, hopefully I find this poster. So it's uh, Sky, the, the agenda of Sky Retreat, and this contains the time and location. Afterwards, I would just append this piece of information, inject all of those in a prompt, and then append them uh, in addition to the questions I'm asking. So basically what, uh, whenever I would want to implement this rag, and the uh, rag based uh, um, answer question answering patterns. I would say first ask the question and then use any of the retriever method uh, or some of the search based method to identify some piece of relevant information and uh, put that into the prompt. So this becomes the entire context. Afterwards, your model will say here is, uh, you know, like according to the search results. The Sky Retreat 2024 is uh, January 8th, 2024. So the this is because the piece of information is here uh, in the searched context. So now in this case, you're moving away from the traditional closed book exam, which is using RMS chatbot, to sort of the open book exam. Now the uh, language model's behavior like changes because now you don't need to actually memorize all the knowledge, all the information that is helpful for answer the questions. You can also read from the context and uh, inf extract the relevant piece of information, do some a little bit of reasoning and come to a conclusion. So this like two pieces of source of information you can allow once you're still your baked in knowledge from your model weights. And otherwise you read from the information from the retrieved results. And then let's, uh, so this is uh, the most exciting part I want to um, talk about. That is, uh, we draw this analogy of, uh, you know, attending the open book exam and attending the closed book, sorry, attend, first day is closed book exam. And then you'd attend the open book exam. And then you, uh, you would attend the raft exam. So what does this mean about the raft exam? Let's firstly see a little bit from the closed book exam, right? This is a question like you'll be asking if you, as a student, as a college student, you don't, you didn't study, you didn't prepare for um, college exam. Maybe you're uh, too busy in a semester doing research, or maybe you're actually party too hard. But uh, you, when you enter to the like exam room, you haven't prepared. So this is, we well, usually we all know what this happens. Like uh, you cannot answer the question the exam is asking you because you didn't prepare. And uh, you know, you're, you're not satisfied. You maybe will get a, a failure. <laughs> and let's see at the uh, next time, right? So if you are, um, you know, like you, you maybe will retake this course in the next semester. And next semester, you still uh, didn't pre you didn't you didn't prepare because uh, like some other reasons, but you entered to the exam room, and this time you found like very luckily or very interestingly, this uh, lecture is this time allows you to do open book exam, so you can actually search. You can actually search. You can actually reference to any of the textbooks. 
So this would uh, greatly improve your results, improve your grade, because now you can actually search on the website. You can actually figure out some of the informations you need. This is like uh, indexing and reading behavior of you, which is maybe you don't have this uh, you don't have some you don't have this kind of knowledge baked in, in your memory, but uh, you can still read and uh, reference to them. So this time you could uh, actually do a little bit better. And uh, this is uh, like the open book exam. Uh, traditional setting is you didn't study because over the whole semester, you didn't attend the lecture and you have no idea what the test is going to be. So now suppose like, you know, at this time, we all know like if you only, you, you didn't attend lecture, uh, you appeared at the exam, which is open book exam, that is pretty good. But uh, mostly you're going to fail. Why? Because you didn't study. Like you actually didn't attend any of the lecture. You don't know what the course material is going to be. You also don't know. You didn't prepare for the final exams. And now you'll be starting thinking about, you know, yourself. Why? What? How should I prepare if I want to actually pass this course in the next semester, which is third semester? How should I actually prepare and how should I make sure, you know, I can pass in the in the next example? So basically like this question of how do we fine tune, train an arm for an open book exam? Now, if uh, not now, like, uh, you know, since the major difference I want to highlight, this is a setting of the raft. The major difference we want to highlight from this setting with the previous open book exam setting it's like now you would be attending every lectures in the new, in the over the whole semester, so that you know the final exam gonna be only asking you the questions about a, a chunk of books, like a reference documentation of books. It won't ask you about anything, only like the knowledge appeared in this, maybe like a set of books or documentations will be mostly about in your final exam. This is also a pretty common setting what we argue in the paper. It's like uh, whenever you have some, you know, a set of news articles or we, whenever you have a set of uh, private enterprise documentations, this is mainly would be the thing you will be asking questions about. It's not like uh, we will be asking questions about everything on the entire internet, um, like maybe happening after a cut threshold cut cutoff date afterwards, it will be a set of documents. So that you can prepare for, right? If I give you a general like website knowledge, uh, entire you know, web, it, does, it doesn't make sense for you to prepare because the knowledge is so huge and then you have no idea what the exam can mostly be. But uh, with a specific domain, which is RAC, oh, sorry, which is wrapped in a specific domain of RAC, you can actually train and prepare your amps and uh, do pretty good in this specific domain. Now, I think a short summary of uh, of this, and I this is something I want to uh, present. I present here to call some attention and give us a short break of the high level takeaways. Like, raft is a training procedure that is uh, for uh, open book question answering in a specific domain. So if you care about your specific domain and uh, you are doing RAG in your specific domain, you should be doing RAFT. RAFT is like both, uh, it's also like uh, can enable this uh, smaller models, much more um, less capable, like uh, less capable models comparing to the general models. You can do well in this special domain. You can also pretty uh, save your cost because your inference cost uh, and your your serving cost, your throughput, your inference cost is going to be lower. Your throughput is going to be very high because of the smaller models. So here is uh, I have talked about like how we actually um, construct this open book, closed book, and uh, raft domains. So hopefully, I convince you like as a student, RM as a student, you should prepare for your exams because. You know, like you, you have to study. You're a good student in the semester, in the university. And uh, I would just also briefly talk about uh, how we actually 
train the model to do this. There are a couple of key insights here and uh, how you do the ref how you do the inference. And afterwards, we'll talk about a little bit of uh, what the briefly the results going to be like and how you can use Raft for your own applications. So here's how we construct our training data set. So Raft training data set preparation, we have the Oracle document, which the question is who invented the transformers? And the answer will be the in the paper of uh, attention is all you need. But uh, in general, like we found if you, since at test time, you're not only providing the Oracle documents, but you usually provide some of the top five, top 10 uh, documents as well. So adding the distractor documents is really important. This would include like you have the some of the Adam paper, some of the glove paper and resident paper. So adding this distractor documents will teach your model one uh, key behavior, which is like we only pay attention to the questions, sorry, to the, to the document that is relevant to your questions. Everything else you present as a distractor documents, everything else you present uh, as uh, you know the, the negative documents, the irrelevant documents that doesn't contain the information which helps you resolve the question, the model choose to ignore. This is like uh, some of the training behavior uh, you can actually fine tune the model for. And uh, the second key concept here is like, when we construct the answers, we also cite from the original documentations. So the model would say, according to some of the, you know, according to the author list of attention is all you need paper, here is the answer to the question, who invented the transformers? You'll be listing authors uh, of the eight authors of the attention is all you need. So this, this citing behavior plus the chain of thought reasoning could uh, greatly like cite uh, pairwise, pairly with this distractor documents, train the model's behavior to actually extract correct information from the entire chunk of context and reason about it and then reach the final answer correctly. So this is about uh, all the data set preparation part. For the inference part or at the test time, what we usually see is just that uh, we take any of the uh, rag, rag inference framework like Lama index, right? Like we would be asking the question of what's the attention is used in Maestro. And then you can retrieve your top K documentations in your database. Uh, this would typically contain like Llama 2, Maestro 7B, and MPT. So we put a question mark here because sometimes you won't be, even you choose the top K documentations, the correct information won't be here. So we want to make that specific. Uh, we want to make that clear, like uh, at test time, we're not guaranteed to have the Oracle documents in your top K retrieved, document, retrieved results, but there's are a lot of tricks like uh, you can do to optimize this and to get the better performance. So in short, this is a very general, very common and general uh, rag pipeline at test time. You would have your questions, you retrieve top K documentations, you feed them into the raft trained RM model, and then you would get the answer. Uh, as long as with some citations and reasoning chains. And then we will be shortly talking about switch gear a little bit about what's the uh, results, how good is Raft. And also I will show you uh, one very simple example of how you can use Raft for your own applications. So here is like the Raft performance of the, you know, since uh, the, the Gorilla API benchmark which is on um, TensorFlow and Hugging Face. This is, uh, we choose this benchmark because this benchmark is usually contains uh, some of the data that is uh, published, some of the models and some of the data sets are published after the gpt 4 training corpora, which is 2023. And also this solving this question requires a specific format, which you can find in the model to follow that format including some citations and reasonings and the, the format of reaching the final answer. So we can see here is like, uh, th this is a very naive Llama 2 plus rack model. And uh, this is the open book exam you don't study, but uh, you can actually provide the rack in like the, the rack settings, which is putting all the context into your 
uh, sorry, putting all the documentations in your context. And the model is doing like 10, 20% accurate. And now I want to show it's a raft. The raft here is the same model, which is Llama 2 7B, but trained specifically on this domain. Uh, although we don't actually have any overlap of the questions in the training and testing data set, but uh, this suggests you like training the model on this specific API domain and ask the model to extract information, to learn to extract information, to learn to ignore the distractors and to learn about how you can actually provide citing and the reasoning chains would greatly improve the performance. Now the model is like actually 60%-ish on Gorilla Benchmark and over 80% on the TensorFlow. And uh, this is like the middle ground, which means I do, I, I do my very standardized instruction tuning. Instruction tuning is, uh, as people also may also know, like it's a quick, it's a data curation process of creating instruction answer pairs about this specific domain, and then you will be tested on this domain. So this suggests that uh, doing instruction tuning is, itself is not as good as doing Raft because Raft also incorporates uh, the key behaviors of ignoring the distractor documents and the key behaviors of extracting information from documentations, as well as the uh, citing and the reasoning behavior. And finally, what I'm going to present to you is like, uh, what if you're a really good student, you're really smart, which is your GPT-4, and uh, I'm I'm the normal like Llama 2 student, right? If you're a GPT-4 student, you're really smart. How well can you do when you don't prepare? Because we cannot, like I didn't, because we didn't fine tune GPT-4 on this specific uh, um, domain, but uh, just to naively show us how does RAG plus GPT-4 can get you the performance. So this would means like, uh, you know, we get uh, GPT-4 is 40% on the hugging face domain and 50% a little bit over on the general TensorFlow domain. The key takeaway for this figure is like, well, as even if you are a really smart student and you don't study for the exam, some students study for the exam can also be better than you at this specific exam. And uh, here, like study for exam is a key to success. Study for exam, aka is like uh, training and fine tuning for RMs. This is really the key for youth success in the exams. Now, I think this is uh, also the, the very exciting part. Like uh, we have got, uh, like even before the paper published, we got a lot of uh, like contact from uh, uh, Microsoft and Meta saying like, we're very excited about this because this would uh, provide you a training recipe, like for every, maybe for every enterprise or maybe for every uh, individual that cares about RAG, you can actually train and fine tune your own RAG models. You don't have to use GPT-4 for all the time. That is really, uh, that is pretty slow and costly, but you can actually have your own like uh, raft model, which is help you to build your own like document QA agents, for example, that uh, knows your specific question, like specific documentations for any enterprise or for any like personal laptop computers. I can actually train a uh, folder of documentations with a, with a raft method. And this raft method will help you understand answer questions with respect to a specific set of folders. This is our original Twitter release, and this is Shishir's Twitter release. And we have the Microsoft AI platform block, which now is like uh, on the very top of the reading list. This raft, a new way to teach RMs to better at rack. And finally, we have the, we have, you know, like the, the GitHub incorporated here so that uh, it's pretty popular and people are using it by um, in, in their in their own use cases. So again, like up to here, I hopefully summarized all of the technical part of uh, Raft. So Raft is a is a fine tuning methodology about uh, mostly about data set preparation, and this preparation would help you understand your document in a single domain, and would be uh, likely to surpass the general models as well. So I think uh, the 
also one key part of the questions uh, people will be asking is, well, how do I use Raft? How do I use that for my own question uh, domains? So Raft is really simple to use. Like it only contains two steps as uh, I think a lot of the other methodologies are also pretty much as this, at these categories. The first one is data set preparation. Uh, we can reference to actually the Gorilla Raft uh, folder. So here we can we can see that uh, this this folder contains like a whole chunk of the explanation details how to you generate our data set. But uh, the, the high level idea is if you want to actually um, put in any of the website or if you put any of the PDF documentations or a chunk of PDF documentations, uh, you can use any of the other language models like GPT or Cloud or any uh, or, or Mistral. You can use them to help you come up with different question pairs about this specific information that you want to ask. That we, and then later on this data set can be used for fine tuning. So the step two is just fine tuning. You have two options. You can actually train on your own GPUs or you can actually use Microsoft's AI Studio, which we also provide a small like explanation or uh, read me in our folder. So I think right now, uh, Jerry, I don't know. I haven't uh, kept track of the time, but hopefully this fits in some of the schedule. But again, like just to summarize, Raft is a technique about fine tuning your models. And uh, you know that hopefully will surpass the general models. And uh, here, I hopefully I show you like how we can use Raft in your own uh, domain. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Tanjun, for the presentation. Um, and yeah, you know, the everything is available on the repo. And actually, if you don't mind, I might spend like two minutes uh, just sharing our own llama pack for this repo. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. it's based on the the, um, the the raft implementation and the source repo, but it also just uses a lot of the llama index components that we have. Um, and so if you know you're on llama hub or source of integrations um we have a bunch of llama packs uh, containing templates for a lot of different like techniques and, and application templates and those things and so Ravi, one of our uh, developer uh, relations um basically added raft as a llama pack implementation and specifically you know it doesn't do the full fine tuning but uses llama index to actually generate the data set and then you can plug it into whatever fine tuning uh, algorithm that you want um, so all you have to do is, you know, download Llama Pack, right? And then without really understanding how it works under the hood, uh, you can just run it. Um, and <laughs> this notebook, you just you just plug in some arbitrary file, um, any documents you want, and then and it'll chunk it up uh, and then um, generate a data set, you know, and add distractor documents, all these types of things, and and then like give you like a formatted fine tuning data set. Um, and so this is basically what uh, Tangent just mentioned. And um, the source implementation is available for you to view once you download the pack. Um, and it's basically just doing, it, it uses like our, our um, prompt and, and question generation components to basically just, um, let's see, it, it generates like a set of questions um, and then uh, from each chunk and then like for each chunk, there's the ground truth chunk and then there's also distractor chunks. And then you just like uh, add all that together for a question um, into an overall data set. So definitely just check it out. Um, it's it's pretty simple to implement actually. And it hopefully it's like an inspiration for you to, to do it yourself as well. Cool. Um, I think with that said, let's go on to questions. So um, I think one of the questions which I think Shishir already mentioned um, or already asked, but um, just for visibility, uh, it would, when you actually train this, like, do you uh, vary the number of like useful versus distractor documents and the order and the prompt? Um, because if you always like do some sort of like um, the same position, that you might overfit to that position during training. Yeah. So there are. I think we did a study. Actually, this is uh, also in the paper. But uh, uh, in a short summary, I think firstly we vary the different positions of. Uh, of the ground truth documents. We already randomized the position of the ground truth documentations. And uh, I think secondly, we found like uh, the in our experiment or in our, um, the experiment over different uh, domains and data sets, we found like uh, we didn't reach a very concrete conclusion of what's the Oracle number of the distractor documents. 
And the only the reason behind this, like uh, a lot of the, a lot of the problems and the the um, questions and documentations are pretty, I think, complex because, for example, in one of the doc Hopper QA stuff, right, you would have to actually reason across different chunks of documentations. Like if I ask who is the you know, the who is the what's the what's the net worth value of the fifth richest guy in the world. Maybe in one chunk of documentations, you'll provide all the rankings of the, um, like rankings of the the, uh, like the, the net worth of different, of the different uh, people in the world. Like uh, it'd be from one to ten, and then you want to grab the specific name who is the fifth fifth guy in the world, and then you want to actually grab his net worth value on another document. So this will be causing some of the problems about uh, whether you need to actually gather different informations across different chunks of uh, documentations. And usually this becomes a little bit tricky. Like you can actually do gather information across two chunks or three chunks. There's no like deterministic number. So what we want to, we, what we on the high, on the um, high level, the conclusion is like, you need to add these tracker documents, but uh, if, how many distractor documents you can, uh, you were the optimal number of this uh, distractor documents is highly depending on your domain. And we don't have a conclusion in that. But uh, this, the good news is like this can generalize to different uh, op K of the documents at test time. So even if I train on five distractor documents or four distractor documents at my train time, at test time, I can also provide 10 distractor documents or 20 distractor documents. And the performance would slightly decrease a little bit, but uh, this would be pretty stable. Awesome. The next question is, um, how do we calculate the optimal number of samples needed uh, for a raft to do well? Just how many uh, training examples, I guess, for, for this algorithm to demonstrate a meaningful improvement? Yeah, this is also some uh, lessons we learned. Like, uh, I think I, I some of the bold claim of my personal take is like, uh, we haven't identified uh, one uh, scaling law stuff for the fine tuning yet. And this include like uh, this, how many samples that you, you would use for your model training on different domains may vary a lot. Maybe for example, for mass and coding stuff, you might need a lot of tokens. But for uh, reading and comprehension, you might not need that much of the tokens, which people usually uh, do very commonly is called early stopping. Like uh, after you train 100 or 200 steps or even uh, a little bit more, and then you want to actually test the, the performance of each epoch and try to uh, determine which one is uh, the good on your validation data set. It's sort of like the traditional machine learning and uh, um, like you try to divide your train and the uh, validation data set and uh, see where is a good stopping point. But uh, I think uh, I think in general, one of the good guidelines of constructing the raft data set is like you want to construct uh, uh, very diverse, like very different question uh, document answer pairs. That usually helps a lot on the performance side with, uh, with you have with, as res respect to you have a very narrow domain of questions. The next question is uh, pretty interesting. I think um, you know part of this idea of mining, fine tuning, and and rag is um, you know you are actually able to incorporate some domain knowledge uh, throughout the fine tuning process, um, but you know you're also relying on the information provided during rag. So in in the sense in the case where the uh, data learned during fine tuning and the data during rag are a little bit different. Um, I wonder, or, or I mean, I mean, I guess it's an interesting question as to whether or not that could potentially lead to hallucinations, right? And like sometimes it's like you actually want hallucinations in general, like you don't want to rely on the provided context, but also like curious about if there's places where that might fail. Yeah. So I think this question is really, I think, interesting because uh, what we have been also debating, like internally in our lab. Is what behavior you want when you do the rag, right? So do you want to actually the model answer your questions purely only based on your context, which I think uh, a lot of people agree on. It's like uh, when you don't provide the context, the model will say something, I don't know, or I cannot infer the information given the text provided. 
But uh, another people or I have been talking to you in our lab. Uh, it's like, uh, well, if your goal is to just answer the questions, the model should also maybe based on its own internal knowledge or based on what it has learned. That's the whole point of pre-training to actually figure out some answers if that's reasonable. So that's what we call the hallucination part. But uh, as long as to like whether hallucination is good or bad, it's also, I think, uh, you know, different people may want different behaviors of model at their at their like training time, but uh, luckily I think what we provide is uh, you know a flexible like hyperparameters. We can actually train the model to be really answer the questions only based on the context, and when the context doesn't provide you with the information, you can construct some simple question and answer pairs like uh, the answer will be sorry. I cannot infer the answer from the information provided in our training data because the Oracle documentation are not provided. Or you can also, in this case, provide uh, another answer, like the different, different behaviors. I still want to answer the questions, even if the documentations, Oracle documentations are not provided. And you can actually select a hyperparameter of how much data you want to include, you want to include in the data set uh, of this type. So basically, like you can decide how you want the behavior as a model. That's also the beauty of fine tuning. Like you have full control of the behavior of your model. You can construct the fine tuning data set, and also you can control the portion of this fine tuning data set to make sure it won't affect the general rag tasks. Well, thanks for the answer. Um, one one question I had was like intuitively, if I you know um, studied but also took an open book exam. Um, Part of what I would probably have a better awareness of is actually uh, knowing where to look for information as opposed to just like processing the retrieved information. Um, I wonder in, in terms of like just future work and that type of stuff, if you think fine tuning can actually help um, the retrieval process itself as opposed to just parsing the retrieved results. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good question, Jerry. I think that's uh, one of the most uh, exciting part and uh, one of the directions you can actually improve uh, Raft. It's like, uh, since your raft already know the documentations, already know the indexing or where to find those documentations, one of the naive, or one of the not naive, but uh, like straightforward extension is for one question, maybe you can ask the model to generate an index of the you know possible like uh, list. For example, the model will say, given Jerry, your question, I want to reference to chapter eight with a title of something. And uh, here's a second uh, chapter, which is chapter four. That is about all, also about uh, some information about this. And then there's a final chapter, maybe chapter 10. Like uh, I want to search for these three chapters. So this will be like an interactive process. Uh, so this will be not your searching the question directly, but you can search the model generated indexing, right? Like I can see, oh, the model seems, seems more uh, preferenced or more biased towards not biased, but the model may preference uh, chapters three, five, and 10 more. So that's a part in the book. I want to actually also embed my search, embed my retrieval more on this. And then I would uh, have to, instead of spreading all the, or retrieve all the contacts from all the chapters, I could specifically pay attention to these chapters. And then I could provide more, maybe accurate uh, retrieve results on this. So that's one thing, like I think uh, this combination of the fine tuning and the rack could be really useful. It's like exactly enabling the model to learn the structure of documentation and uh, maybe propose some of the potential candidates before you even do the retrieval part. And afterwards, you could... And Jerry, another very mm -hmm. simple technique, the way you can use this is, so Tianchen mentioned is one where you're trying to do a multi-turn, right? Even for a single turn. Today, if you look at similarity search, you're basically taking the embeddings uh, and then or you know, every technique like either the continuous chunking, et cetera, is embedding based. But if you were to think of this as a key value lookup, you can now ask your LLM to actually come up with the key. Like you give it a document and you ask the LLM, hey, give me a key and a value. Well, the value is the document itself. Give me a key that you want to um, insert this document into. And so later on, when you get the question, even though there's, I mean, obviously, it's stateless, but you can assume that the LM comes up with reasonable keys to retrieve documents, or even the keys will be embedding based, right? If not exact similarity search on strings. 
So it's like the thing you fine tune the LLM for isn't just on processing the retrieve results, it's on the query generation and, and like planning aspects uh, so that you're able to, uh, you know, whether it's keywords or, or some like multi like turn planned or something like that, um, it's able to better do that than some out of the box model. Precisely. Just to be clear, we don't do that today, but I think that'd be pretty interesting. interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the next question I had actually, um, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts on this is, um, so, you know, obviously there's all these like long context models coming out, um, like, uh, like Gemini Pro, Claude, and, and actually more specifically, it's like long context models, plus the fact that they're decent at information recall uh, within the context window. Uh, I'm curious how you think about the relationship between that uh, versus like uh, kind of like retrieval augmented uh, fine tuning, as in like, do you see the, do you see like kind of long context models as like have, doing raft on top of these models is still complementary, or do you see it like kind of removing some need to, to um, for instance, like fine tune based on knowledge, or we can just like dump stuff into the context window? I I think you still need it, right? Because no matter what you do, freshness of data is critical. Like in the example that Tianjin showed, who won the Super Bowl, et cetera. So freshness of data is will be a factor to drive this. But secondly, uh, today, long context models, if you were to do, now just pass attention, but the classic test attention all the way, if not anything you're paying in terms of latency, right? Because at inference time, you're now going through all of these docs. Uh, so in terms of performance metrics, latency is bad. Uh, and in terms of pressures of data, you still need it. And there's a third aspect to this, which is uh, there's been some work around lost in the middle uh, that shows that even this long context models are not great for like, if you have a needle in a haystack kind of setting, or if you want to do like aggregates or find me the number of times this word was presented in the document, et cetera. Though it's good for like concepts. Uh, so I guess you, you'd still like these two will exist, like the long context will go, will keep growing because you know, there's big PDF documents that people want to pass, especially for doc QA style scenarios. Uh, so yeah, I do, I think like these two will evolve mutually. Uh, I don't know, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, actually, Jerry, I think, uh, you know, one part is like, uh, although you mentioned the recall of the long context model is really pretty good, but actually like, uh, you know how the model can process information, not just finding some of the needle in the in the entire C and copy paste them. How the model can actually inf like process those informations and reach a reasonable answer. I I kind of think that still the long context model is still a little bit uh, like decreased from the short context models because the model just uh, the attention mechanism is uh, uh, spanning a wide like very long range of context. It's like maybe inherently this will, like your attention won't be, uh, it will be spread, you spread your attention into this long context. And also, so that's why I think, uh, you know, because like, uh, because of this, you still can actually improve your model's performance with rack, even you have a long context model. Yeah, sorry. Even if like you have a long context model, you can still improve your performance using this rack techniques. And secondly, more interestingly, I have a feeling like even uh, how they train this uh, long context models, they might use something, they might, I don't know, I don't have a source, but they might use something similar to Raft because Raft is technique like also designed to process information to ignore the irrelevant part and uh, try to reach a reasonable conclusion in the in their fine tuning time. So I think uh, whoever is training this long context models, they might also incorporate some amount of data that's very similar to the raft style to their uh, instruction tuning data set. So you can use, uh, you can actually like, uh, you know, this basically raft also enables the long context in some other way. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a good point. I guess it doesn't really count as um, replacing your technique if they're just adding, yeah, like the idea of adding distractor documents or something during the training of long context uh, models. I mean, that, that's basically your guys' technique. And so that basically means like you're helping to like improve long context models as opposed to like kind of it being a replacement in some way. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, no, this is awesome. Um, I, I think we're basically out of time. I set this out for 45 minutes and I think it's a nice uh, wrap up. And so, yeah, thanks, Tanjun and, and Shashir for sharing your work um, and really exciting. I think there's a lot of very useful applications, um, both in terms of fine tuning and in terms of just generally thinking about how do you improve uh, retrieval and processing uh, for, for RAG. And, and, and I think this is, um, yeah, it's one of those things that's a pretty simple idea. Um, and I think it's 
fairly straightforward to implement, but it's a very powerful one. So yeah, for everyone listening, thanks for joining in. Um, and we'll have this on YouTube and we'll see you next time. Yep. Thank you for having us, Cherry. Yeah. Can you send the YouTube link, please, for everybody?